What, what was the catalyst for this, Hen? What, what, why, why in the autumn did you go, yep, I'm, I'm, I'm going to come back? There were a, a few catalysts. Firstly, I mean, for the last um, 11 years since I gave up my licence, I've still been involved in the sport and loved the sport. And uh, we've had a lot of horses where I live at Lockinge to teach to jump and help them to jump and just to, to educate. And then I've seen those horses go back onto the race course and win races, which was lovely. Mm. But I just thought it would be nice to have some of the horses to see them through the, their careers from my yard. Um, you, you, we're going to get to the, to, the, to the looking back at yesterday sooner because we, we, we now makes perfect sense to, to touch on Not So Sleepy. And I'm going to come back to your returning to the training ranks and, and why on earth you'd be doing it with Brendan Powell <laughs> soon enough, who I know is downstairs and I, I, I jest, Brendan, because you're a, you're a fantastic man. Um, but Not So Sleepy is one of those horses who um, Huey said it to, to us yesterday on Racing TV and, and paid tribute to you and, and how much you, you'd help the horse. Yeah. Um, and, and you must... Well, you must be delighted to see him win the, the Grey One fighting fifth yesterday. It's fantastic. I don't think he's a horse that I'd ought to manage to have trained anyway because <laughs> Huey's been so clever with him. And I think Sleepy has an idea, ideas of his own, what he's going to do on the gallops and how he's going to behave. He said yesterday that he, he, you know whether he's going to run a good or a bad race because you, you just you know what mood he's in. And mm. if he's in that bad, not today mood, there's very little you can do to get him out of it. Yes, he's, he's got a total mind of his own. Hmm. So what can, what can you do to, to counter that? And this is a horse who yesterday looked about as straightforward as, he's, as he ever has. What, what can you do to, to counter that sort of, that, that, that you know, not today part of a horse? Or, or is there, uh, you know, it, with a half a tonne of animal, not much? It's very difficult other than to keep them well and happy. There's no good um, using any, any force on them. Mm. You've got to sort of cajole them and, and, and kid them that life's good and they want to go out and do it. And Huey suggested yesterday that part of the reason he is, or has been around such a long time, is because he can think about it. it. Almost because he is never going to put absolutely everything in, no disrespect to him, and, and therefore that leads to this, this, this longevity in a career. Yes, he'd be an interesting human being, wouldn't he? <laughs> yes, I said to Steve Mellish, Dave, I said, if, I, if you were going to interview one of these horses, <laughs> would you interview Not So Sleepy or Goshen? And it, I think it was a tough, both of them have their quirks. I think you might get more sense out of Not So Sleepy, but he might be a bit grumpier. He might be grumpier, but yeah. I think you've been slightly safer hooves when if you were talking to Not So Sleepy. Goshen, you could end up anywhere uh, with yes, the conversation. Yes, quite right. You wouldn't want to get too close to him. No. And then you wear it well, managed to, to kick the girl that was leading, leading oh, out. Yeah. yeah, because she's very feisty. So well, between the three of them, um, mm -hmm. it, it, it was quite the race. Um, to, just, just on Not So Sleepy, it, it, Specifically, did you just target his jumping and help his jumping at, to make that transition, or were there other things in particular that you that you did? No, we we just had him to learn to jump with us. He stayed for a few days to begin with, and uh, and then he came back each year from Huey because Huey uses my fences and hurdles anyway. It's on his license because I have a lovely field of, of jumps, and um, certain trainers allowed to use them, and uh, he he just comes back for a refresher each year. How do, you teach, how do you teach a horse to jump? You start them with a little low poles and, okay. and then you go a bit higher. We have a, a loose jumping school where they go around without a rider. Terry always said it was the riders that did the damage. Um, <laughs> so it, it, excuse my severe ignorance on this subject. So loose school, no rider, no rider. but on, a, on, on, on some sort of long rein? No, no, oh, completely right. loose. Okay. They have two uh, walls all the way around it. So they go down a pathway between the walls with little jumps in the middle on the track and they go around loose. We stand in the middle to send them round as though they were on a lunging rein. Uh -huh. And they teach themselves how to put themselves right or wrong at fences. And, and, and some of them, I imagine, are more natural than others, of course. But it, it mm. is, is there ever a lost cause or not? Very seldom. Okay. Nearly every horse can jump, but some jump better than others rather like human beings. Yeah. We do some jobs better than others. Um, but it is amazing, loose school. <clears throat> it was put in by Reg Hobbs in 1951, and Reg trained Battleship to win the Grand National in 1938. And he brought this idea of the loose school back with him from America, where Battleship was American-owned. 
and um, when he retired, the loose school was put in at Lockinge, and I'm still able to use it now. Amazing place. Even the days of Fred Winter, he would come over and use it. Because uh, uh, horses are perfectly capable of jumping without rider influence on their back. Mm. But of course, you know, we see we see riders. Some will look for an extra stride. Some will ask them. So I, I guess some horses. Need, a, need that extra little bit of help, but some appear naturally very clever. They can fiddle one, they can go mm. long of their own accord. Yeah, put in short strides and they remove their feet quickly in front of an obstacle. Mm. But um, it's, it has been copied a few times, this loose school, and Gordon Elliott has copied it in, in his yard, um, exactly the same dimensions. Mm. And he's put on the door, hen's ring. <laughs> That's it. That's good. That's nice. Um, let's hear from Not So Sleepy's trainer yesterday at Sander. You um, rode a winner for Huey? Yes, one of his first winners, I right. think. I thought it was his very first, but he correct, corrected me and said oh, it was his second or something like that. Okay. Yeah, I think it was owned by his father, so there's quite... Um, owned and bred by his father, so it's quite special. Uh, he and, 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 and Lady Blythe, between them, have had a, a, a law Blythe, had a, mm. who sadly wasn't there, had a fantastic season between um, the, the flattened jumps with, with the likes of Quickthorn and, and Not So Sleepy. Um, something that he mentioned there, which I wanted to ask you about, was intelligence in a horse. Um, because is it fair to say you can get some horses who are too intelligent for their own good and therefore and you get some horses who will try the, the, the phrase, run through a brick wall for you, etc. But maybe they are lacking some of that now. So does, is, does, yeah, do you think intelligence and, and protecting yourself for a horse come together as one? Yeah, sometimes the horses that are, are too intelligent probably realise that the racing and some of the jobs they are asked to do are, are not for them. Mm -hmm. um, then there are others who are quite happy to do anything that the riders or the trainers ask them to do, and they just go along with life. It's mm. the same with people, isn't it? Yeah. Um, you know, they get the people, I used to be a school teacher, and I know that some children would quite happily do what one asked them to do, and others rebelled. Yeah. And you get that the same with horses. How different a world do you think you are, a racing world, are you going back into as a trainer now, or not at all? I think it's very, it is very different. Um, there are a lot more issues financially aren't there now and there's um it's, it's very competitive i think that the that the standard has improved i mean i think some of the jump racing is extremely good now um and some of the horses racing and interesting you're saying this is somebody that won three consecutive gold cups but it looked pretty it looked pretty good then yes we i always say in life you, you've got to, you've got to be lucky and uh, we were lucky and we a bit of, we just had a very good horse mm. But um, I do think it has changed. I mean, take the Gold Cups when Arkle ran. I mean, there were four or five runners sometimes. And now the big races, there are a lot of runners. And it's m very much more competitive, isn't it? There are a lot of runners, David, at Cheltenham. And, yeah. and those, those big races there. Um, I don't know, you know, going back to, to, to Tingle Creeks of, of 20 years ago, um, whether or there was obviously the famous one in '03, I think it was when, when, it, when it was perhaps more competitive um, than, than we're used to seeing now. But I wonder if there is just more of a focus towards that spring festival in in, in the jump season than, 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 than was the case back 20 years ago. Possibly, I wonder about the sourcing of horses as well. It just seems to be so difficult now to get these really good 150 plus rated. Horses, and I know William Williams has got a lot, and Gordon Elliott and Henry de Bombard, and the, the, the powers moved to Ireland, the Irish point to point field became the source for a lot of them, and that they were getting first first dibs on. But you just look at every division over here, it's, it's so thin. We're going to move on to the two mile chasers later with John Bond, the two mile hurdlers. We saw no Constitution Hill yesterday. You're looking at five, six runner fields with long odds on favourites in so many divisions. You had a four runner Betfair chase, four runner Charlie Hall. There just isn't that depth to the, the divisions at the top. And yeah, they'll fill out at Cheltenham because the Irish horses will come across. Mm -hmm. But over here, it's a significant issue that, and it's not for the one to try. And you saw the sales at Newbury after the Coval Gold Cup, 100,000, 200,000 owners investing an awful lot of money. Mm -hmm. But it just seems to be so difficult now 
to source that talent and in number that, that gives you that tenth thing division. You look at the novice hurdlers and novice chasers coming through and thinking, well, they're next year's, that's a seed corn for next year. And it's still a trickle. You're not looking at returning to the levels where you'd have 10, 12 runner races. Because these are grade one races in their own right. They, these are races that owners love to win a Tingle Creek. They'd love to win a Fighting Fifth. These are really prestigious prizes. But there just isn't the number of horses in training here at that level to fill the field. And on the prize money too, it seems that the graded races, the grade one races, are often less prize money than the handicaps. And mm. So what, what mm. do the public want to see and what do the, what the bookmakers want, the handicaps? Are, but um, the pub, the, what, what, what do we want? Mm. It strikes me as well, because at, at the moment you're, you're buying point to point winners for 200, 300, even 400,000 pounds. And you're running in grade ones for 45, 50. The economics don't make no. sense. Mm. Those prices now for these point to point winners, they're book one prices. Not top end, but one, but you'd buy a, a Frank or a Dubawi or a, mm. a, a, you know, for that sort of 300, 400,000. It, mm. it, the, the, the prize money hasn't moved with the, or the, the, the cost of horses accelerated way beyond. The, grade, the, group, the grade races should be much higher. And I think it would attract more horses if you had the grade one races with higher prize money. Two, two things that you, you both touched upon there. First of all, Ireland now must be, unless it's a huge amount of recency bias in my head, must be a, a, a far greater, a greater force than it was um, as, as a whole, numbers-wise, numbers of quality-wise, than it, than it was 15, 20 years ago, do we think? Yes, I would agree on that. And is that a... Is that just a sourcing of horses, do you think? Sourcing and possibly the way they're trained now. Um, because I've been lucky in the last f few years, I've spent quite a bit of time in Ireland and going around the trainers and going racing. And um, it is highly competitive over there. But the horses are brought on. We don't have it in England. I've said it before and people get fed up with listening to me. <laughs> but we don't have the chances for the younger horses to go through these schooling bumpers and schooling hurdles. So they go out on the race courses and learn before they actually race. And that teaches them. And then they get the horses so much more forward in Ireland. And they're, they're ready to, to fight much earlier. Whereas in England, the horses are more, you know, the, the training facilities are good in England. But they, it just overall is not the places where they can go and, and mingle with others. I think the programme helps in Ireland as well. If you're a big owner spending big money, you send a horse to Ireland. You've got Leopardstown at Christmas. You've got a Dublin Racing Festival. Mm. You've got Cheltenham. You've got Punchestown. You have three or four peaks during the season where you know you're going to have Grade One runners for Grade One prize money at, at big tracks, and there's a real rhythm through the season. Mm. In Ireland, that's something that we, we don't get now. We haven't got that. We haven't got those stepping stones leading to the spring festivals, if that is the be all and end all, but there should be grade one stepping stones that are so competitive and that's what we're missing at the minute, it's that mm. momentum through a campaign. The day to day prize money is much better though as well. It is. It's, mm. Why would you pay, you know, the same training fees to have a, a horse in England and you can raise for much more money mm. in Ireland or, or in Europe, it's, that's, that's the problem we've got in the UK. Just to return to, to you and, and Terry, who you've mentioned, and, 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 and I feel we, we should revisit Terry, and, and um, I think there's a quote in the paper of you saying you, you weren't a master trainer, you were a trainer who had Terry Biddlecombe. Um, do, w w was, was losing him the reason that you, you, you were no longer a trainer in your own right, and therefore have you coming back as a result of finding someone like Brendan? Is that, is that fair to say? That's correct, yes. I mean, he was a, a major force in my training days because he had, he had so much knowledge, having been a jockey and been all over <clears throat> the country on the different courses and ridden on all the courses, everywhere but Fakenham. Well, um, he hadn't ridden there? No, he never rode at Fakenham. <coughs> um, um. But he, he, he put, had such an input and he was so good with the jockeys and, and explaining to them what to do and telling me where we should go with the horses. Mm. So were you very much, you, you were the, um, the, the more hands-on trainer at home and he was more the planner and, 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 and was that how the dynamic worked or not necessarily? It was, yes. I was more, at the end of it all, he didn't used to like going racing very much because he wasn't feeling very well, but um, he used to go, do, go racing and do all the work on the race courses. Mm. And he talked to the jockeys in the days when we had the good winners at Cheltenham. I never spoke to the jockeys that morning at all. He, 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 he briefed them. And I thought it's far better for 
one champion to try and teach another champion, or tell another champion, like when he talked to AP. <laughs> and is... So, and, and so the, this is the, the dynamic that you and Brendan are going to have together, is it? That, that is exactly what you're looking to replicate, I guess. Yeah. And when it comes to race planning, is that something that you will major on, or Brendan will, or somebody else will? I think that would be a joint venture. Okay. Um, Brendan would probably be better at it than me now, because he's done so much travelling. And he's, um, but he's, and he's absolutely spot on. He never misses anything on it with his, with his mobile phone, looking at every sort of aspect of racing. Mm. Um, but I love, I love the idea of playing. I like saying what I think a certain horse is ready for. The final thing I want to, want to touch on before we go on to, to, to John Bond, um, and I guess because it ties in a little bit with with um, with, with best mates and and how you campaigned him. And I don't remember at the time, it was before I really started working in racing, but I read that you got a bit of flack for, for hardly running the horse, etc. That ties in with what we are talking about yesterday with Constitution Hill. Are we only gonna see him once this, 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 this turn of the year and maybe once more before a champion hurdle? Is that acceptable for the, for the, for the top rated horse in, in, in training? Um, obviously, the, these moments, winning three gold cups, you can't have done anything wrong because you won three gold cups. Right, what's, what's your take on it all looking well, back then? Who, who are you racing the horse for, your owners or the public? Uh, that's a, I think that's a very good... Who are you racing the horse for? Definitely the owners. Mm, exactly. Definitely. Well, Nicky was thinking of his owners and his horse, cons preserving that horse because he is obviously outstanding. Mm. Um, and... We, were, we had a lot of flat when we had Breastmate because we only raced him a few times because he was much more delicate than people realised. And I was always being accused of keeping him in cotton wool. But nowadays, it appears that other trainers with Go Cup horses oh. do the same. I mean, even Willie Mullins. Is a, is a, is a, is a three-mile, two-and-a-half furlong staying chaser different, though, to a, to a two-mile hurdler? Can they be campaigned? or aggressively, um, a two-mile hurdler? Possibly, but I think some of those three-mile chases take a lot out of horses, yeah. and the people don't realise what it does to them. And there's only a limited number of miles that any horse can run, yeah. I, th I would have said anyway. Watch live racing now on racingtv.com.